Good afternoon, good morning, everybody. This is the first colloquia of uh, this year, September, of the Instituto Astrofisica de Andalusia. And today uh, we have the presence of uh, Dr. Jana Kautzi from uh, the National Solar Observatory in Boulder, Colorado, United States. And uh, she will talk about a new look at our star, the Daniel K. Uh, Inouye Solar Telescope. Jana will be introduced, introduced, oh, introduce, make the introduction by, sorry, <laughs> by Isabel Marquez, our PI of the Severo Chua program. Please, Isabel. Thank you, Rene. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for being here again after the summer break that I hope that you, you could profit of it and all the good wishes you have, have been accomplished in, during this time. And we are uh, back again with our, our strengths. And um, I, I especially thank you, grateful to Gianna Kautzi, Kautzi? Kautzi. Kautzi, who accepted our invitation for this uh, first uh, um, uh, web document of a Severo Chua project at the Institute uh, after the, the summer break. So thank you very much, uh, Gianna Kautzi. And um, so Gianna Kautzi is associate uh, uh, scientist at the United States National Solar Observatory in, in Boulder in, in, in Colorado. Uh, she received her PhD from the University of uh, Florence in Italy in 1993. And after a few years in the United States as a postdoc, she went back to Italy as a staff researcher at the uh, INAF, at the uh, Osservatorio Astrofisico di Arcetri in, in Florence, where she spent over two decades. And, and during this uh, period, she was a co investigator for the highly successful interferometric by dimensional spectrometer IBIS, a double Fabry Perot uh, system built in Archetri and installed at the Dunn uh, Solar Telescope of uh, NSO, uh, where it operated for over 50 years as a facility instrument. Uh, she has been a member of the science working group of uh, the DICIST, so the Daniel K. Inouye uh, Solar Telescope, uh, as Rene said, since 2005 and has collaborated on various aspects of the project throughout these uh, years. And since moving to NSO in 2016, she's been working mostly on organizing the community involvement in the scientific exploitation of DICIST. She currently serves as the chair of the Science Review Committee for observing proposals submitted to DICIST. Her main uh, scientific interests reside in the magnetic uh, and dynamical structure of the chromosphere of uh, the sun, including wave dynamics and heating, as well as the physics of blurs and small scale eruptive phenomena. Today, Gianna Cozzi will talk about these questions with the perspective of a new look to our star, the, the sun with the dickest, since it will provide the highest resolution solar observations ever achieved as well as the sensitivity to measure the vector magnetic fields in the chromosphere and in the faint corona. Thank you very much, uh, Gianna, for being with us today. And the, the board is yours. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for this very nice introduction. And uh, I have to thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to give this talk. And uh, as we said, uh, I would, I so wish I were there. <laughs> you know, Granada is a really beautiful place. I've been there several times and I, I really enjoyed it very much. I had the most terrifying taxi ride of my life in Granada. It was really Good. interesting. So, uh, so I, forget, I forgot to say that this uh, web document is wonderful, but we would like to have you here in person in Granada. Yeah. So I extend the invitation to an in-person one for the future when possible. Yeah, thank you. Next time. <laughs> um, okay, so let's get down to to the presentation. Um, um, you already heard my name and I work at the National Solar uh, Observatory. Um, the National Solar Observatory in the US uh, is a national lab and uh, it is uh, funded indirectly by the NSF. And the charge to the Institute is that of building and operating um, astronomical facilities. Uh, that can be used by the national community and also the international community. Some of you might be aware that NSO um, built and operated the GONG, which is a network of uh, six uh, observing stations uh, devoted to helio seismology, and one of them is up on the Teide Observatory. And so today I'm going to talk about uh, the latest and by far largest of the facilities that NSO has built 
that is the DKIS, the Daniel K. Inoue Solar Telescope. So this is a fairly recent picture. It's a very big building, as you can see. It's a four meter solar telescope. And um, uh, so the building itself is very high, is about 35 meters, because for daytime observations, you want to put your telescope as far as possible from the ground to limit the, the turbulence in, induced by the heat, of course. Uh, and it is about 20 meters in diameter here. And it is so large also because it is an off-axis telescope. And uh, I will explain some of this later in the talk. So we are the PI Institute. The funding has been mostly from the NSF. Uh, the telescope is built on Aleakala on Maui uh, in the Hawaiian Islands at about 3,000 meters of altitude. Um, it was formerly known as ATST, the Advanced Technology Solar Telescopes, and in 2013 has been rededicated as the Daniel K. Inoue Solar Telescope. Daniel Inoue was a senator of Hawaii in the US Congress. He's, he was there for about 50 years. And he was very instrumental in, in uh, bringing the astronomy, in developing the astronomy as we know it in the Hawaiian Islands. So after he died in, two, in 2012, a lot of facilities in the islands have been renamed after him. Construction started in December of 2012. And currently we have an official closing date of construction as of 15th of November of this year. And when it will operate, it will be the largest solar ground-based telescope by far. The second largest are of the class of 1.5 meters. There is the German Gregor telescope, again, the Teide. And then there is the Firgudi telescope, uh, the Big Bear Observatory in uh, California. The team is like such. The, we are the PI Institute, and the director is Thomas Rimmel, and some of you might know him. And then there are several COIs in, um, in the US. And uh, there is a European participation in terms of instrumentation. Uh, one of the first light instruments, the VTF, that is a uh, um, Fabri based uh, spectral polarimeter, uh, is being built by the Kippenhoer Institute in Germany. And uh, the visible light detectors that are 4x4K that can be read at 30 hertz have been provided by a consortium of UK universities. And uh, also I need to mention that there is an ongoing collaboration with your own institute uh, for developing a spectral inversion machine match on the, you know, the following the footstep of what has been done by your institute uh, for the fee instrument on solar orbiter. And the PI is Jose Carlos. Okay, so I think I don't know exactly who is my audience today, but I imagine that some of you might ask themselves, why do you need such a large solar, uh, telescope to study the sun? And so during my talk, I will try to give you uh, some ideas of science use cases that do require a much larger collecting area. And then at the end, I will present where we stand with the construction and uh, first, uh, first images and so on. So very briefly, I think that we could divide uh, the major avenues of solar research in three, you know, the sun as a cool star, the sun as a laboratory for plasma physics, and also the sun as the source of space weather. And this is very unique to the sun, you know, and us and ourselves, and while the other two are more, you know, astrophysical in general. So during my talk, uh, this is a vast field. And so I will be uh, discussing mostly the atmospheric structure. And uh, the main takeaway, if I'm successful, will be that you believe that in the solar atmosphere, the small scales are crucial and the magnetic fields rule, really, they are king. And when you put the, these two things together, you get to my last line that might seem amazing, but the current solar observations, high resolution solar observations are photon starved. And that is why we need a larger, a larger telescope. Um, so also, so we have a common base. Again, I don't know how many of you are solar physicists or not. Um, <coughs> let, me, let me have a few slides of uh, introduction. So you all know that the sun is a magnetic star and the magnetic field is really the thread that unifies the, the, the atmospheric behavior. Um, here we have uh, some full disk, some full sun maps of the magnetic field at the surface in the photosphere. Um, that have been acquired by an instrument that's called HMI on board of the Solar Dynamical Observatory. And this is what we call the longitudinal component of the magnetic field. The magnetic field will be a vector and the longitudinal component is that along the line of sight, right? 
Uh, so during the maximum of activity, you see a lot of magnetic fields, very strong, uh, all these black and white uh, patterns uh, that are the two different polarities. Um, you can, if you have a trained eye, for example, this will be a spot. It's very compact, very round. And so, so these fields can be of a few thousand gauss. And, um, and they are concentrated in the active region uh, belt. Uh, during minimum, uh, four years later, you see that the sun is almost fully gray. You know, that doesn't seem to be much. However, one has always to be very aware of resolution. Uh, this kind of um, maps have a spatial resolution of order of about a thousand kilometers on the surface of the sun. And I remind you that the radius is of order uh, 700,000 kilometers. Uh, so if you zoom in, you see that indeed, in, you know, what seemed almost gray is really peppered with a lot of other uh, magnetic structures of smaller scales. These are what we call the network field. And uh, uh, from these maps, we can infer that they have a strength of order of a few hundred gauss or so. They are actually organized in patterns. I don't know how clear it is for you. There are some semi-roundish cells that we call network cells of uh, um, size is about 30,000 kilometers. Um, how do we measure these fields? Uh, we have various ways, but the workhorse of our, of our research is really using the Zeeman effect. So we, you know that uh, in the presence of a magnetic field, transitions um, levels might split. And, and so that you have uh, um, um, a pattern of a spectral, intensities uh, that uh, will show you will that betrays the presence of the field so not only that so we don't only look for the split of the lines but we especially look at the pattern of polarization of the light so we analyze all the stokes uh, parameters this is a doublet of iron line that we use very much and you might recognize this and it's down here and so by studying how the intensity and uh, the general stokes vector the i q u and v uh, spectra uh, behave, you can retrieve uh, the magnetic field uh, in the plasma that gave origin to this, uh, to this emission, right? But what I wanted to point out now, uh, because I needed throughout the talk, is the amplitude of these signals. Now, this is all normalized to the continuum intensity. You see here you're around one in the intensity, but when you go and look at the circle polarization, this is a semi quiet area of the sun, but we talk about um, signals of order of 5%. Uh, in the linear polarization, things are even worse. And you are talking about things of order of few per thousand. So this is the magic number, this 10 to the third uh, signal to noise uh, ratio that we need to have in our observations to be able to study um, magnetic fields in a variety of structures in the, in the solar atmosphere. And actually, you know, this is what we can do now at our semi-diffraction limit, um, but we would like also to be able to do more. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go through that in my use cases. And then finally, again, to have a common vocabulary, you, re, you, re, you I'm sure you know that the solar atmosphere is usually divided in different pieces that have very different physical properties, the photosphere, the chromo, photosphere, chromosphere, and corona. So if this is the height and zero is the surface of the sun, and we go up to 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 kilometers or so, and I've put also the sizes in arc second because we often use them interchangeably. Um, the run of the temperature is this in the solid line. So from the surface of about 6,000 Kelvin, you decrease uh, the temperature all the way to about 4,500 Kelvin at a height of about 500 kilometers. And that is expected from a, uh, an atmosphere in radiative equilibrium. Then something happens and there is a, some mechanism that start depositing energy at this height and above. And so the temperature goes up again. And it goes to a value of about seven, 8,000 Kelvin in this stretch that we call the chromosphere. And the temperature doesn't change much there because whatever energy you put into the system is used mostly to ionize hydrogen. Then eventually you run out of hydrogen to ionize uh, around this height. And then so you have, uh, you keep putting energy in the system and you have an explosive heating and then you get to the million degree uh, typical of coronal temperatures. And the corona, of course, extend much further than these uh, five arc seconds of 3,000 kilometers. 
while the density, these are uh, models, average models uh, in um, hydrostatic equilibrium. And so the density goes down exponentially so that the chromosphere is of order 10 to the four times less dense than the photosphere. Okay, so let's go to our first uh, science or second, uh, first and second science use case. And we start from the, from the photosphere. Uh, so from the deep part of the atmosphere of the sun. Um, so outside of active regions, the main pattern that you observe on the surface of the sun is that of granulation, which is the manifestation of surface convection. So you have these kind of roundish cells that you can see in this image. This is a continuum about 500 nanometers um, that are of a size of about a thousand kilometers. And uh, they are surrounded by these darker lanes, as you, I hope you can see, that are what we call intergranular lanes. And this is uh, um, convection. So the brighter things are a bit hotter than the darker one by a few hundred Kelvin. And they are bubbled of hotter plasma that comes up and eventually cools off radiatively, and then expands uh, and uh, precipitates back into the solar surface in the intergranular lanes. So not only the granules are brighter, but they also have an upflow while the intergranules, uh, that is pretty lam laminar, while the intergranules have downflows that become fairly turbulent. These things evolve on a time scale of a few minutes, what, five, six, seven minutes, I think they should go. So I hope you can see the movie. And um, so we do understand this fairly well. We have uh, theory, we have models, we have simulations. And you might be aware of the work of Aspen et al. in the early 2000s that used these kind of simulations to actually, they apply radiative transfer and they, and they reproduce the synthetic uh, uh, photospheric uh, spectral lines, comparing those to the observations. And the agreement is really outstanding. Is the color, you know, blue and red here, while the green would be what you would be able to obtain with classical models, I say. So everything is nice and good. What happens if we put magnetic field into this system? So here is an example. This is data obtained by the Hinode uh, spectropolarimeter, which is uh, a satellite uh, uh, that you might be familiar with, is a 50 centimeter telescope. So here are my Stokes parameters that I introduced before. Only now I don't have just one pixel, but I have many. The vertical direction here is the spatial direction of the sun. And by analyzing the uh, polarization, you know, the, the polarized signal, I can retrieve the magnetic field map, much like I showed you earlier with HMI. So this would be <coughs> a larger field of view, I mean, a large field of view that I'm showing you. Uh, the granulation field of view that I just showed in the previous slide will be around uh, this, uh, you know, the size of this little white square here. And so here we, we see uh, quite a number of things. We see the same network field that I mentioned earlier from HMI, this more compact and stronger field uh, concentration here. Surprise, surprise, when you look at it with a much higher resolution and the resolution of these, of these um, data is of order of 300 uh, kilometers, or so uh, at least three times better than what we had with HMI, you see that these fields are not 100 gauss, but they are more like a kilogauss. So really the strength of the, of, of the field depends strongly on the kind of resolution that you have. The second thing that needs to be pointed out is that beside the network field, there is magnetic field just about everywhere, right? Smaller scale, peppered black and white, just about everywhere. And at least at this resolution, these fields seem to have strength of order of about 100 gauss. This is the longitudinal component, like I mentioned before. Uh, the transverse component you derive of the field or the vector field you get from the linear polarization signal. And if you remember my first slide with you know the amplitude of the signal, uh, with a signal to noise ratio of order 10 to the third, which is what this data have and what the majority of our data have nowadays, uh, you have an error, which is of the order of 100 gauss, which is of the same amplitude as the strength of your field. So here we are very limited in the kind of information we can get. If we could get a higher signal to noise, uh, what happens? And this is the same kind of data 
of course, it's not the same because that was five second exposure and this is 70 second exposure. So you go a factor of four higher in your signal to noise ratio. You see that the, the, the things change. I wouldn't say dramatically, but they change substantially really. You have a transverse component, you know, you have a strong linear polarization signal, hence a transverse component of your field just about everywhere, right? So this is one of the, um, you know, the main ideas of having a larger telescope that you could collect more photons and try to do a polarimetry, uh, you know, more sensitive polarimetry and go and study these weak, what we call weak internetwork magnetic fields that seem to be present uh, all over the sun. Indeed, there is at least two questions that come to mind, right? The first is, uh, uh, you know, <coughs> what creates all these little um, magnetic structures throughout the sun? And one of the um, original ideas was that they would be a sort of uh, um, side product of the dissipation of active regions. Uh, that doesn't seem to work too well as a, as a thing because there doesn't seem to be any, any um, correlation with the solar cycle in terms of how many there are, where they appear and so on. The other idea is that they are created in situ by a local dynamo. Um, that would use the turbulent motions that are present in the intergranular lanes and some seed magnetic fields. And we will see uh, something in a couple of slides. Uh, the other question is, are they important? You know, they are so small, maybe they're not important at all. But again, estimates um, make it that, so that, that these kind of fields seem to uh, bring about to the solar surface about 10 to 100 times more flux than the actual active regions. So they could very well be in, very important in the overall energy budget of the atmosphere. Of course, we don't know what is their, for example, effect on higher, higher up. Like. Okay, so um, people have uh, proceeded in studying these, uh, these, these fields with better data, better resolutions and so on. And I like to mention the work of Milan Gosic that was a student at the IAA a few years ago. So he went and got a similar data of much higher spatial resolution. Now we're talking about 100 kilometers. And again, not only you confirm that these things are everywhere, but with this kind of data, you can actually uh, see that they really reside in the, in this small fields really reside in the intergranular lanes only. And that they are brought about by uh, convection. You know, the, the convective motion of the granulation will shuffle around uh, this, uh, this field. And um, so uh, let me see if I can play the movie. If you study there, if you study their evolution, you see that a lot of these little baby, baby structures eventually meet something of an opposite polarity and they disappear, whether they just retract inside the, in the surface of the sun or whether they undergo some sort of reconnection that could uh, liberate some energy to insert into the chromosphere, for example, that is still a very active uh, field of research. Um, much like before, these data have our magic number signal to noise ratio of order 10 to the third. And if you could do better, you could certainly have a grasp on the, also on the transverse field, on the transverse component of this magnetic field that would be necessary also to, to study whether indeed that they undergo a connection or not. So this is my first, let's go. Oh, no, sorry, I went too far. This is my first uh, uh, science use case for a large telescope, right? Have a larger collecting area so that you can push the polarimetry to 10 to the fourth and have a good grasp on the full vector field of these uh, small scale uh, magnetic fields in the quiet sun. Or, you know, the photons are what they are. It's not that you can magically multiply them. You could do the same kind of things that we do today, but at much higher uh, spatial resolution. And that is, um, you know, and go and check whether a turbulent dynamo really exists and, and if it has the properties that some models that we have nowadays uh, uh, predict they will have. Um, so these are just a two class of models. This is pure MHD. This is actually non-ideal MHD. It takes into account some partial ionization in the photosphere and they all predict uh, fields maybe with somewhat different strength. But anyway, so that would be uh, a very interesting thing to study. Um, just briefly also in remaining in the photosphere that the same kind of, uh, of um, new observations with higher um, sensitivity polarimetry or better spatial resolution will be very useful also to study the fine structure of sunspots. 
Um, this is an image that I found really amazing. I don't know how well you can see it, but the left side of the image is a simulation and the right side of the image is an observation. So beside marveling how well the simulation work, uh, what I wanted to point out is the amount, the amazing amount of small scale structure that you see that the simulation tell me exists in the, in the sunspot proper that I cannot yet grasp uh, with current observations. And this will be a remnant of probably of convection cells uh, that uh, will be appearing in between very strong, uh, uh, strong field in the spot. So doing polarimetry of these things is still uh, beyond what we can do today. A larger telescope would certainly uh, help in that sense. Okay, so I better, I better get going. Um, let's move up and let's go to the chromosphere. That is my favorite subject. So the chromosphere is a fairly difficult part of the solar atmosphere to study because it's a really a transition region. It goes, you know, you have the photosphere, which is cold and dense and mostly neutral. And then you have to transition to the corona, which is very, very hot, super tenuous and fully ionized. And the chromosphere is in between, right? And so you have all these kind of confusion thing. Um, the chromosphere is also the place where the magnetic field uh, really starts to dominate. Um, you've seen in the photosphere that at least away from active regions, you have the plasma buffer buffets around the field. And we know that in the corona, the plasma needs to follow the field. In the chromosphere, we are half enough. So this, we usually use this parameter beta, which is the ratio of the gas pressure to the magnetic pressure. And in the chromosphere, this is the place because of the low density, this is the place where this thing is around one. So depending on where you are and when, uh, there will be times when the plasma wins or when the uh, magnetic field wins. And I think this is very well illustrated by this fantastic image of an active region acquired in the core of the calcium 2 8542 action uh, line, which is in the infrared triplet of calcium 2. This is a large area. This is about a quarter of the solar radius. And uh, we have an active region with a spot and all their surrounding things. And uh, what strikes my mind immediately is the presence of these dark uh, elongated features that we call fibrils that really remind me of the, uh, the filing, uh, the iron filing when you do the experiment with a magnet in high school, right? Or in middle school, whatever. Um, so that um, they seem to uh, evidentiate uh, magnetic field lines. And we think they do, but actually we don't know absolutely for sure because measuring the magnetic field, the full vector of the magnetic field in the chromosphere is fairly difficult. And I'll get to it uh, at the end. So and in, just in case you don't trust me too much, this is the corresponding magnetic map from HMI of the same uh, field. And I go back and forth a few times so that you clearly see that these can these fibrils seem to originate from strong magnetic field and extend uh, outward. Um, there is a lot to unpack in this image. Um, the chromosphere has been neglected for many, many years because it was too difficult at the end. But since 15 years or so, uh, things have improved substantially. And so now there is a lot of things that we understand fairly well. Uh, for example, in this image, uh, you have a lot of little bright things, let me call them little bright things, but they are very different in nature. For example, in this area that you might remember, there isn't much photospheric magnetic field at all. Um, all these tiny dots that have sizes of about five, seven hundred kilometers or so, they are acoustic shocks. Um, you know that we have uh, pressure waves at the surface of the sun, the P-modes, so-called P-modes. Some of them might, can propagate upward, uh, depending on the frequency, they can propagate upward. And then eventually, since the density decreases so much, uh, they steepen and shock. And we know that they heat modestly their surrounding, and, but they are very intermittent. And uh, they have a periodicity of about three minutes or so. Um, and that they certainly are not responsible for the chromospheric heat. Um, moving up, something here where, you know, 
where there are stronger magnetic fields, but especially where the magnetic field has an inclination with respect to the vertical, we have a very similar class of phenomena that we call magnetoacoustic shocks, which are the same thing, but the fact that the, there exists an inclined magnetic field acts as a, as a filter that allow like a low pass filter that allow um, lower frequency waves, pressure waves to propagate into the chromosphere. And since those have a higher power, uh, these shocks are more powerful and they liberate more energy again. So they, they, there is intense local heating. So this could be a portion of our chromospheric heating, but what we know is that they don't seem to have any effect on the corona. And then we go to this thing, uh, where you have not only strong fields, but they're also very tightly packed together. So these are fields that are mostly vertical. They have no room also to expand on the side, right? Um, these are the places that we know are the foot points of coronal loops, very hot coronal loops. Uh, but again, why they are heated, we don't know. Of course, the magnetic field is responsible, but is it because of reconnection or is it because of dissipation of magnetic waves or things? So these are still a very active um, area of research. And it's interesting that, is, that these are also the sites where um, we can observe a phenomenon which has been very popular in solar physics in the last 10, 15 years, again, that we call spicule. And again, I don't know why the movie doesn't go. Let me go this. Okay, so this is a movie again of a chromospheric diagnostics in the UV. And uh, this is looking at the limb. So you might be able to see uh, the limb of the sun here. So I have circled the same things as before. So this will be the acoustic, purely acoustic shock, magnetoacoustic shocks, and this would be those bright things in the dense and packed magnetic field area that we call plage, but seen from the side. And uh, so let's see how clear that is. So you see the acoustic shocks that are very intermittent, uh, a little more strong here in the magnetoacoustic. And here you can probably make out that there is a lot of this very thin and elongated, uh, very long thing that stick up, you know, chromospheric plasma that stick up from from the surface of the sun and goes up all the way to you know, several, uh, many thousands kilometers. Um, this might be more clear in this other movie that has been cleaned and filtered so to evidentiate only the things that happen at the, at the limb. And uh, so just to have a sense, these are very dynamic things. They evolve on order of a few seconds or so. They're very thin. And here I've put a number. I've put 300 kilometers, but I also say less than because no matter our resolution, they seem to be smaller, <laughs> you know? So they're always at our diffraction limit. So um, whether they have, uh, um, you know, we really don't know how, how thin or not they are. They are very tall, so certainly much above the classical idea of a chromosphere. They seem to harbor strong upward motions so that there is a lot of um, you know, current of, of thought that says that they are jets probably produced by some sort of reconnection in uh, current sheets that are there where you have all these uh, vertical magnetic fields that move around uh, against each other. They seem to carry strong alternative waves and uh, also they seem to have coronal counterparts. And I've put a question mark here <coughs> because the resolution, the spatial resolution of current coronal observations is so vastly worse than what we see here that will be, uh, it's actually difficult to, to find a one-to-one -one correlation, right? And uh, people have been very interested in them because they seem, you know, if they have a coronal counterpart, not only would they provide energy, but they would also provide mass if they are these flows to the corona because we need mass up there in order to, to have a corona at all. Um, things are still a bit controversial. Some people don't believe that those are flows at all, but they are mostly heating fronts, again, uh, along this current shift that I mentioned. And I don't know if it is clear, but uh, these are data that have been acquired uh, one second cadence uh, with a resolution which is similar to the previous slide. And um, I think I, I don't remember which one of these, but if you pay attention to some of these features, you see that some of them appears at once. 
Uh, and that would be obviously incompatible with the idea of an acceleration, right? Uh, so that is why the idea of heating fronts uh, is actually, um, you know, um, a viable alternative to the idea of jets. But anyway, this is essentially what we know. And also I would remind that, that we do these very high cadence things, but these are only images um, because we cannot yet do full spectra of uh, such a large field as so to have a sample of these things with cadences of this of the order of seconds or a few seconds or so. So this is, well, I will skip this, but I will just put my statement uh, that the case for a large telescope will also be uh, important to study these features at a higher spatial resolution. For now, we know they're less than three or 200 kilometers, but I mean, do they keep getting smaller, which will tell us something really or what kind of features there might be. And, and or going and doing spectroscopy at a high, higher um, cadence. Of course, this kind of study will vastly benefit from having an idea of what kind of magnetic field uh, gives rise to these features. And here we are, you know, very, very uh, behind <laughs> because with the famous 10 to the third signal to noise ratio that we can have at the diffraction limit and a cadence of a few seconds uh, nowadays, that is just not enough to measure chromospheric magnetic field. And um, I think I will skip the actual polarimetry thing um, because I want to go to the corona, but you know, take my word for it uh, that uh, we really need uh, uh, something of the order of 10 to the fourth signal to noise ratio. So we need many more photons in order to do a proper polarimetry of the vector magnetic field in the chromosphere. Okay, so I'll go to my last science topic, which is the corona that I want to mention because the case uh, has a large, uh, uh, you know, um, a large part of, of the project is devoted to the corona. So um, I already said that, that in the corona, fully ionized uh, the magnetic field rules because it dictates where the plasma can, can be or not. Um, so here is uh, an HMI map again, and the corresponding map of a coronal emission in an iron nine and iron 10 complex which is around one mega Kelvin to one million Kelvin. So you can see a lot of emission where we have strong fields. And also you can see these fainter features that we call corona loops that really uh, follow the magnetic field. The magnetic field of the corona determines, the corona determines the heliosphere status and so on. And we are essentially blind to it nowadays. Uh, again, because you can imagine as you go away from the surface, you have, you know, the field decreases. So it gets uh, from a thousand gauss, you go down to 10 gauss or something like that. So measuring it becomes very, very difficult. And also the corona emits in, um, doesn't emit much, I mean, it's, a, it's a very tenuous plasma. Um, by the way, most of the, of the information that we have nowadays from the corona comes from UV observations from satellites like SDO and, uh, and that they have no polarimetry and a much coarser spatial resolution than what I've shown until now. Um, the spatial resolution of these images of the order of a thousand kilometers or more, if you do spectroscopy, uh, UV spectroscopy, uh, that goes further to two, 3000 uh, kilometer resolution or so, because you, know, you don't have light really. <laughs> and so you have to integrate it. But anyway, so we know very little of the coronal magnetic field. We have been using a lot of extrapolations. So you take the boundary condition, you take the field of the photosphere and you extrapolate it upward with some set of assumptions. For example, you can do potential extrapolation or you can go a little more sophisticated and allow currents in the system, but only along the field lines and what are called force free field extrapolation and so on. And we compare them to the plasma uh, features that we see, to the intensity features that we, that we see. We have very little measurements of the magnetic field to compare this extrapolation with. In a sense, this is a bit of the holy grail of current solar physics to go and study the coronal magnetic field. So much so that I think in the last literally few years, there have been a flourish of, uh, of ideas and techniques uh, that do not use polarimetry necessarily. Uh, so here I've put a collage of, um, of very recent works. They're all from last year. 
So in this case, we have a full disk. You can see it here observed with the chronograph so that you kill the, the, the disk emission. And you study uh, the emission of some lines uh, uh, at a little distance from, from the disk itself. Um, so by studying waves in intensity and velocity uh, and uh, their properties via models, you can go back to the kind of field that will allow these waves uh, to behave as they do. And here they have, uh, you can see the scale here that you have a field that go from um, very little to about four Gauss, which is a number that has been mentioned many, many times in order of magnetic fields. Now these are, you know, these are general structure broad, um, Course resolution. There isn't there aren't obvious active regions here. Uh, this is instead using synchrotron emission from uh, um, you know from radio measurements. And actually, I don't know if they use polarimetry here. I'm not 100 percent sure. Uh, this will be an active region because they're looking at flares. But still, um, I don't know if you can see it here. There is the limb, so this is off limb. But they find fields of order of several hundred Gauss. So there is quite the difference between this. So is it a matter of being in active region versus quiet, or is it a matter of having a better resolution or so on? That is, you know, to be studied, TBD. Uh, and this one is very, very neat idea. This is something that I still don't understand very well, but apparently there is um, by virtue of some strange quantum mechanics uh, mechanism in the presence of the magnetic field, of a magnetic field, there is a transition of iron 10 that appears that wouldn't be there otherwise. And this has been observed uh, by chance um, several times with this UV spectrograph. And so by studying that transition in active regions, uh, Landi et al. Uh, last year managed to give us uh, the magnetic field map of a full active region. As you can see, this is the intensity and this will be the field. And again, we see that the numbers are actually much, much higher than uh, what maybe we were expecting. So this is a, a very much work in progress. And um, Dickist will like to enter this, uh, this uh, debate and fray by using polarimetry. Um, so there is a lot, not a lot, there are several uh, visible and infrared lines that can be used for doing coronal polarimetry. Um, they are forbidden lines, so they are excited in a different, and they are excited in a different way than the UV lines. In particular, they have a component. Um, the levels are excited also by radiation that comes from the disk. Of course, uh, the UV continuum is about of the disk is about zero, but of course, the infrared continuum, the oh, visible and infrared continuum of the disk is large. Um, this is a uh, bad and good. Uh, it's bad because the formation of the lines is more complex and you have to, you know, to be careful about that. But it's also good because the component due to radiation is proportional to density and you can see structures much further away from the disk. The UV structures will be visible only, you know, at a, at a lower distance, at a smaller distance from the disk than the visible. Um, coronal uh, structures. Uh, as an example, this is an eclipse uh, with a white light. This is just a uh, Thomson scattering of the photospheric continuum, a lot of fine structure. And these are spectroscopic data of the same eclipse in iron 11 and iron 13. Here, I, this is 11, I got it wrong. So they are visible. And they are actually sensitive to the presence of magnetic field. And actually you could measure the strength of the field along the line of sight by uh, via the Zeman effect. So measuring the circle polarization of, uh, of the light. There is only a little problem is that the typical emission of these lines are of the order of 10 to the minus four of the disk intensity. So that is, you can imagine why you might need a very large telescope to start studying this. Now I am optimist and I say that 10 to the minus four is what we know nowadays, but it's also true that nowadays the coronal observations from the ground have been taken with very low spatial resolution, right? So if we manage to get a much higher spatial resolution, much like the case of the, of the field, we might be pleasantly surprised and the actual intensity of the single structures might be, might be larger than this. So we might have a little uh, easier life. 
Um, I will skip this slide. So there are, I already mentioned, there are several lines that could be used to do polarimetry. The most uh, uh, plausible candidates are a doublet of iron 13 around one micron, and then silicon nine at around four micron, and the case will be able to go to these wavelengths. There are, light, there are coronal lines in, further in the visible, for example, the famous green line at around 500 five, uh, nanometers uh, that are even stronger. But the question is that the sky is much brighter at those wavelengths. Uh, uh, so the scattered light in the atmosphere goes with wavelength, the inverse of wavelength. So going towards the infrared, that becomes a best, a better bet in order to get a good, a good signal. Of course, we will not do diffraction limit in a few seconds uh, with 10 to the fourth. That, that will not happen. Uh, just uh, to give you a sense of where we stand, this is an observation, one of the very few observations of this kind of data that we have nowadays. These were taken with a coronagraph uh, on Aleakala, but the coronagraph was less than a half a meter of a telescope. Um, so here we have 10 panels that go from closer to the disk to further from the disk. So 0.1 solar radii and 0.28 solar radii. So the Gaussian shaped curves are the intensity uh, observed in iron 13 and the wiggly noisy thing are the circular polarization. And you might be able to see it's not a great figure, but there is a, also a fit with a typical V, the uh, Stokes profile, Stokes V profile, um, that would be the one that gives you the intensity of the field. Right, so this is the kind of thing that we had until now, and they had to expose forever and have uh, super big uh, pixels of order of, uh, you know, like. So Dick is hopes to do this kind of observations in a much, much, much uh, less uh, time, and uh, hopefully also with higher uh, spatial resolution. Okay, I think this is. Sorry, this is the end of my use cases, and I hope I convinced you that we could really use a larger telescope, and especially one that can do polarimetry and do it well. And so now I have a few slides on the telescope itself, and then I will have uh, some first images. Uh, this is a cutout of the building that I've showed you earlier. Um, this is a telescope assembly. There will be relay optics at this level, and then the light is sent down vertically to this uh, rotating platform, the Kudai platform, where all the instruments reside. The instruments are here and they are fixed, they don't move ever. Uh, this is very typical of solar, of solar uh, observations. Uh, here in red, I don't want to go through them all, but I have put what I consider to be the most important um, features of the telescope. And actually I will, I think in the next slide, I have uh, highlighted them differently. So this is a four meter diameter. And that has been what I've been talking about until now, you know, how to use your enhanced collecting area. This will be at least 10 times more light uh, that we have a collecting area than we have with the largest telescopes today. So you could do, ultra high resol spatial resolution and the diffraction limit is less than 20 kilometers uh, on the surface of the sun at 400 nanometers or you can use the telescope as a light bucket and the light bucket will allow you to do things that we do today with a higher much higher cadence or with a much higher precision uh, polarimetry and that is our goal right and we have the magic number that today is 10 to the 3 and we wish to get to 10 to the 4. The telescope is all reflective, and this allows us to go uh, all the way to the thermal infrared, so about 28 microns, although currently the first light instrumentation limits, is limited at 5 microns. Uh, the telescope is an off-axis, and uh, which is also the reason why the dome is so big. If it were an on-axis, it could be much, much narrower. But it's off-axis, and uh, one of the main reasons of the off-axis design was to avoid uh, the spider and the central obscuration, and um, that have uh, um, consequences both on the spatial resolution and on the scattered light. The scattered light is a big thing, uh, in because we want to do corona, and uh, if 
told you the kind of of intensities that we that we that we want to get. Yeah, I think I didn't mention it, but um, we often measure the sky brightness in millions of the solar disk, and uh, a, a normal sky brightness is of the order of at least fifty to a hundred millions. So that would be already at the level of uh, the signal that, that we expect from coronal structures, although I personally hope they will be better. Uh, but uh, so you have to kill that kind of signal. And that is also why the mirror, the primary mirror is highly polished. And there is a lot of systems in place to keep it clean uh, from uh, water washing and CO2 washing and so on. And also recoating facilities, which is next door. Um, the coronal science use case is also the main reason why the telescope is in Aleakala, on Aleakala, because Aleakala is very well known as a very dark uh, coronal uh, sky place from site service and so on. And finally, it will be a multi-instrument uh, uh, telescope in the sense that not only it's got many instruments, but most of these instruments can also work together so that you can have a multi-wavelength or a multi-topic approach to the kind of science that you want to do. Um, so this is just a quick uh, drawing of how the light goes. So you have the incoming light here, the mirror, it's an off-axis, so it's an F2, so about eight meters there is prime focus, and uh, shortly after there is uh, M2, that, that it is uh, about 90 centimeters, I think. And here in the prime focus is where you put your heat stop. You might imagine that having a four meter telescope looking at the sun will create a lot of heat uh, that you have to manage. Indeed, not only the dome is thermally controlled, um, the... <clears throat> The actual, uh, only a small portion of the solar light actually goes to M2 and then the instruments, and the rest is rejected by this so-called heat stop. Then there is a, a complex system, hardware system here of absorbers and uh, pipes of coolant to keep that environment at stable temperature within, you know, ambient, ambient temperature. So then in the secondary focus here, the Gregorian focus, we have the limb occulters if we wanna do corona, corona studies. So you have to kill the disc, of course, and the polarization calibration, which is a major part. I mean, I would say that this is almost like another instrument. And then finally, you relay the light to the CUDE platform. The CUDE platform looks like so. So it's about 16 um, meters in diameter and it hosts five instruments uh, that are here very quickly depicted. So let's see if I can describe them in some detail. So the VISP is a classical spectrograph, slit spectrograph that would do polarimetry. Um, all the instruments do polarimetry apart from this. So this is a classical spectrograph. Um, this is an imager. Uh, broadband filters, uh, this has been thought as the camera of the telescope, right? It's the one that will produce the best diffraction limit images and the highest cadence. This doesn't have any spectroscopic uh, capabilities, really, it's just broadband and doesn't have also, doesn't do polarimetry. Then we have the DL NERSP, which is again a spectrograph uh, that will work mostly in the infrared from one micron onward. And um, it's an IFU uh, using fibers. So here you will be able to have both the spectral and spatial information at once. Of course, nothing is free in light. And so you will pay that with a fairly small field of view that you can observe at once. The VTF is a German uh, instrument. It's a Fabry -Pero, double Fabry Pero based uh, uh, spectral imager and polarimeter indivisible. And finally, you have the cryoners, which will be the coronal instrument par excellence. So it will work in the, in, in the infrared all the way to five microns, and it's cryogenic in order to kill noise as much as possible. As you have seen, coronal observations are fairly uh, delicate observations. Uh, and here, I think that I have put the images, uh, let's see, this is the VBI, you know, corresponding to the position, more or less. 
uh, this is important. This is the adaptive optic system. Of course, if you want to do diffraction limit with a four meter, you do need an AO system. And this is a high order. It's got 1,600 actuators. And there is actually work in progress for a multi-conjugate uh, system that will come in the next few years. This four, one, two, three, four instruments can work together by splitting the light. And that means that you split the wavelengths, really. Um, all of the light at any given wavelength go to one, one instrument. And then with being splitter, you know, the redder light goes to another and the redder, redder goes to another and so on. Uh, the cryo will work alone. The cryo, the corona one will work alone. Uh, this I will skip. And then I'll go with nice pictures. So this is the building very recently. Uh, these are the Pan Stars telescope, if you're familiar with. Uh, so you see it's a big thing. And this is the Air Force facility. The, the, the KIST is just at the edge of the mountain because that is where the best daytime seeing conditions were found to be on the site. This is um, recently they were doing an on-sun campaign. And so you can see the dome doesn't open completely, just the aperture for the, for the beam, for the primary mirror. And the dome is actively thermally controlled. And then this is just for fun because the, pe the person that took this picture claimed that uh, there is no filters applied and this is around noon and this is the color of the sky. So you understand why uh, Haleakala has uh, one of the best corona skies in the world. Um, the telescope, I'm sure you've seen many in your lifetime. And so uh, just a scale, these are two, two people. And here is the assembly with the heat rejector. And this is the secondary. The heat rejector here is probably was a preliminary version. I think that now they have a different system um, from the back. M1, uh, as I mentioned before, needs to be kept clean and needs to be recorded maybe more often than others. So the Air Force facility has a coating chamber, which has actually been enlarged just because of the kist. So that is where the mirror is taken when it needs to be recorded. And this was, I think, the last, about a year ago was the last time that that was done. The CUDE lab, uh, it starts to be in crowded by now. So all the instruments are on site apart from the German one. And uh, some of them have undergone science verification. Some are doing it as we speak. Um, so here, I think I wanted to put this picture because we were talking about before. This is the science verification um, test of the VISP. And here is Roberto Casini that you all know as a PI of VISP and Alfred Deven is project scientist. And here we have some polarized light <laughs> image in the in the on, on the screen right as taken from from the visp we i don't have anything that i can really show you about that so the ao it's an instrument in itself it works at 2000 hertz and so you can imagine it's a fairly uh, complicated enterprise and then finally because i'm super long as usual some first light images so this was the first light uh, last year was taken in the red continuum at about 800 nanometers and that the nominal resolution of that wavelength is of the order of 30 kilometers on the sun. So this is um, about uh, 35, the size of a super granular cell, of a network cell, as I mentioned very early in the talk. And you might say, well, I think you showed me this before, right? When you have that movie that looked fairly similar, this is true, but now I can zoom in, for example, and go and look at the details in between, you know, in the granules, but especially in between the granules where we know, or we think we know that all the magnetic fields are swept. And uh, this, uh, it is, um, I think it's a very fantastic image that you see, not only that there are these bright things that again, we correlate with magnetic fields, but they can be extremely small. I mean, we're talking about a few pixels here and also have these very convoluted shapes that uh, probably depend on the kind of turbulent flows that you, that you find in the intergranular veins. So uh, we don't have polarimetry of these things yet, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, a movie about how they evolve. And I think the movie has a bit of a stop and go that are, it repeats itself at some point. So, but it's a few minute movie. So you see how the convective motion sweep these uh, elements that again, we think are magnetic elements and how they carry and stretch and uh, so on. 
The first image of a sunspot, uh, this was taken actually not with an instrument per se, it was taken with the camera of the AO system at 500 nanometers. And uh, again, I don't know, I just, maybe we can discuss this in the comments. Uh, the amount of details is staggering and you start to see, maybe because it's a small sunspot, but uh, you start seeing a lot of these details uh, inside the, the Umbra proper that were in my simulation image. And the last one, uh, this is fairly recent. This is the first image in the blue continuum. Now we're talking 450 nanometers and the diffraction limit is of the order of 16 kilometers. And uh, there's a, a small active region with, and I am actually very curious about these kind of features that have all these spikes that come out. Are they baby spot in the making or something? So um, again, I don't have, uh, for example, evolution of this one, but here there's a detail you know, like something inside the intergranules and is that really like a baby spot or is it a hole? I, I don't know. So thanks for your attention. I'm always too long. And uh, I leave you with a couple of papers and uh, the website that you can consult to for your, you know, if you want to know more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jana. Uh, it's been, uh, a uh, very, very enlightening talk. And uh, well, at least I, I enjoyed it mm, very much. I hope the, the, it has been the, the same for, for all the attendants. Uh, so the, the, the floor is open for whoever wants to, to ask Janna. Was convincing. <laughs> oh. Yeah, Isabel, I have, is, Isabel oh, has his style great. <laughs> yeah, no, excellent talk. I enjoyed it a lot, really. Uh, it was very clear. And uh, yes, now I'm excited about uh, the possibilities of this telescope. Can you tell us a, a bit more about the science verification phase? How is it going? Uh, uh, the instruments are already more or less uh, operational. Well, you have seen images from the VBI. You know, you know well the VBI was always meant to be the first thing to come online because it's the one that can tell you whether the telescope works or not, right? And uh, um, so, uh, let's see. Full disclosure here: uh, when we show these beautiful images at the diffraction limit. They have been acquired by making full use of the AO system, but of course there is a lot of post process post processing as well. You know, we go and do what we call image reconstruction, and uh, so for now that has been applied to these images to reach the diffraction limit, and um, it works. We don't know yet whether you know the seeing is stable enough to have like long sequences of these things because this is all we this is what we really want, right? To have extended sequences of that. So for now we have some, some burst of that. And uh, so, but I mean, the VBI works, the filters work apparently. I haven't seen yet an H beta, mm, I, I'm, I'm waiting on that. Um, and the science verification for the VBI has been completed. The VISP had their science verification period in uh, um, April, May, Mm -hmm. uh, so, and they're working on, on the data right now. The, let me get it right here. I think that the, the, the cryonerisp is doing it now. Okay. It's doing it now. And the DL nurse will be doing it just towards the end of the construction phase. So we're talking about November. I think they, yeah, they had, a, they have what they call the on-sun campaign when they actually use the time for these kind of things and that are interspersed with more technical uh, things that need, that still need to be done in the telescope. But so the idea is that by November 15th, all instruments will have undergone um, science verification and um, the VTF not, the VTF is not physically there yet. The VTF will, should be there next spring, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. But it's quite impressive because uh, what you have achieved uh, during the pandemic 
is yeah. pretty amazing. I mean, uh, so beautiful. yeah, they they have been uh, <laughs> they have been three months. They 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 stopped for three months. Then they started going and you know reduced number of people up, uh, all precautions and so on. They are still in that mode, although it was relaxed. You see, there were several people in that in that room, right? Mm -hmm. uh, now, unfortunately, Hawaii is uh, going up again with cases, and I don't know how that will will impact uh, the rest. But overall, I mean, if you ask me, building a telescope of this kind in less than ten years is is a miracle. That there was, you know, they started, they literally started groundbreaking in December 2012. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, I think, I think it's so. more. Very good luck for this later, uh, the, this phase, the last phase. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there is many, many more things to do, right? You know, yeah. okay. Uh, I think there was uh, Isabel then. Yeah. Yes. I, I yeah. think. Yeah, yes, uh, yeah. I was just. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I, I just wanted to, I mean, it's not just to pose questions, it's just to, to congratulate you, Gianna. It has been a, an excellent talk, Thank you. Uh, very informative and uh, for, with exciting science and perspectives. Um, I already told you that I'm from the extragalactic field, so galaxies and so on, and, and I found it, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm uh, really grateful for the level you've given to the talk because I think it's been, I mean, you, great. You were my target, right? You were my target. So thank you. That, that's no, what I wanted to say, that I thank you very much uh, for such a great talk. Thank and you. congratulations for the huge work that is behind. Oh, yeah. It's not, my, it's not me. It's a lot of other people. So yeah. So it's a team. Oh, yeah. Of course, with oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I didn't do much. I mean, I just go and give talks, right? Yeah. Great, thanks a lot, and I, I, I mean, I insist on inv inviting you for, Thank you for the future when you will. I mean, it, it, it'll be great to have you here. Thanks. Okay, thank you, uh, Rene. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's, I have a question, but it's not from me. As uh, you know, we are live in YouTube, and a person oh. Oh. called David Orozco. Oh. He, he went to <laughs> ask a, a question. <laughs> is he on the beach or something? <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. Uh, the question is, uh, first he, he say, okay, congratulations for the speaker and the, all the team. And the question is, for the coronal observation, how much close to the limb of the sun do you expect to have useful polarimetric observations in emission coronal lines? The, the goal is to have it very, very close. We're talking about a few arc seconds above the limb. That is the capability of the, um, of the occulter. So you can uh, over occult and under occult, but I think that the minimum would be about five arc seconds, which is 3,000 3, 3, kilometers or so. So very, very low. The, the hope is that everything works well, right? Because the scatter light there would be a killer, really, if you, if you had uh, something leaking from, uh, from the disk. Um, but very low, I think, I didn't say it, but the maximum that you can point at the telescope, because after that, uh, there are mechanical issues, you can go only uh, 0.5 re solar radii away from the limb. That's the maximum, but the minimum is really very few thousand kilometers, yeah. So one thing, I mean, I talked about the polarimetry, but certainly, you know, doing imaging of the corona and high resolution together because of the VBI can do that. You can observe a coronal line with a filter, with a broadband filter and the chromospheric line, for example, H-beta at the same time or calcium two at the same time. Uh, that, that would be extremely interesting in itself without even touching polarimetry. Yeah. And any more questions? Well, I certainly have several, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, uh, I wanted to, to ask you about the, the uh, adaptive optics uh, system. So uh, how is it working right now? Is it still uh, fully operational? Uh, uh, which are the periods uh, with uh, 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 stability and the requirements uh, you, you expect to, to reach? Oof, 
to, 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 I'm not sure I fully understand the question. The system is working well. It's working at two kilohertz, right? And they have these 16, 1600 actuators, a little less, I don't remember the exact number. Um, <clears throat> it is a single layer, you know, AO in a sense is classical in that sense. Um, I don't know exactly what kind of requirements you, you had in mind. Uh, how long it can work for, say for an hour or 10 hours yeah, or whatever. Instance, yeah. I, I don't know, actually, I cannot answer that question. I'm sorry, I, I, okay. but I will, I will investigate it. Yeah. 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 No, well, I, I'm, I'm puzzled by, by, by evolutionary studies uh, 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 that we, we gather yeah. uh, sunrise, for instance, and yes. uh, it, it, the, the wealth of information you, you get when you see uh, uh, parametric yes. movies is, is tremendous. So yeah, no, I I understand, and yeah. I really wait, waiting for for having those movies from, from right. Movies. So the site seeing the site survey uh, gave information on the actual seeing uh, uh, properties of the site, and they had extended periods of very very good seeing uh, overall the year. Now you know that was taken more than fifteen years ago. Uh, whether, unfortunately, we all know that climate is changing sensibly. And uh, for example, at Sac Peak, they did notice quite a variation of the seeing characteristics with respect to what everybody remembered as the standard, right? Uh, so uh, what that means at Aleakala for daytime observations, I don't think we can properly say at the moment. So I, I still hope there will be very good sequences, but as you know, I mean, these, these are not every day, you know, they happen. Uh, we, this might be a surprise to our nighttime colleagues, but really much of the science that we do is done on a relatively small subset of observations. The ones that are acquired with the best weather conditions, yeah. right? Because the mediocre conditions, we've got so many of them, we really, they don't, in a sense, they don't tell us um, too, too much, and especially from the ground, they often don't have um, consistent quality, right? If it was always the same, you could do a long study and so on, but today is like so, and tomorrow is a little less, and then this changes, and so within, on. Within, uh, within a day, which are the, the, daily, the daily variations of seeing? Uh, so the best seeing, very good, is uh, early in the morning, very early in the early. morning and so on. And that was originally thought, um, you know, uh, from the results of the site survey that the high resolution observation would be performed in the morning. And then you would switch around noon and afternoon to coronal data, right? Because there you, you know, you cannot do point uh, or whatever at seconds, right? Because you've got no light, so you still have to integrate it. So you would exploit those lower uh, seeing quality times. And also at noon, the coronal sky is the best. So. That was the original plan. Then how easy that is, in principle, it is easy to switch instrument and uh, easy enough. Uh, but of course, you, you, you can do that when you are at a certain level of uh, confidence in how you can operate the whole thing, do the calibrations and so on. Sorry, I have a, a machine outside okay. my window. I don't know if you hear it. <laughs> so Rene, again, you have... Uh... Thank you. There is another question in, in, the, in the chat. Astronautico asks you, are you working with the Solar Park Space Probe team or data from the spacecraft as a method to confirm the data or to compare? Um, so several, several answers. Uh, I personally am not. Uh, many of our colleagues uh, are um, actively using Parker Solar Probe uh, data for other kinds of studies. Um, Parker Solar Probe is an in-situ instrument, so they measure things in the heliospheric environment of the sun, right? And uh, most of what I've said today was referred to the actual sources at the, at the sun in the solar atmosphere. There is uh, quite a bit of collaboration around, not me personally, that, um, you know, to, to put the two together to see what happens at the sun and then what the probe measures 
in C2 at a given time in a, in a, in a certain position. And certainly we have plans, you know, the case still does not observe, we're still constructing, but we do have plans uh, to perform coordinated campaigns uh, to address this, this kind of problems, right? Study at the same time the source and the effect in the, in the heliosphere, both with Parker Solar Probe and also Solar Orbiter. So, so, um, okay, Jose Carlos, I think it's, uh, it's okay for ending the talk here. Yeah, yeah. if there are no more questions, uh, we, can, we can close and, uh, well, before, before closing, um, I would like to thank again Jana. Uh, for her for her kind and kindness in in giving the talk, in preparing a talk for uh, a wide audience, <clears throat> and for being uh, uh, kind enough as for citing the work of our colleagues in, in, here in the in the institute, it is very much appreciated. I should say that uh, one what? of our last professional uh, uh, in a change. Uh, was a kind scolding by her on my on my uh, paper who had forgotten to, to cite some of her work and her team. So uh, uh, I, I uh, really appreciate uh, her citing uh, IAA's uh, work. Uh, which indeed uh, is uh, interesting uh, and, and well. Uh, I, I would also say that uh, we are aiming, aiming to be as less delayed as possible to deliver, deliver the, in fact, the inversion factory, which is expected to, was expected to, to be delivered last year. And due to the pandemic, we are even more delayed than you guys. So I mean, excuse I, us. <laughs> I'm still surprised that we work. I mean, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm done. I was just yeah. like, I'm tired. Yeah, so so in these conditions, you. you know, it's difficult. So. Thank you but anyway, much. no, I mean, IAA and you guys are the, the, the leaders, the world leaders of these uh, quite some uh, fields, right? So of course I cited you. <laughs> so okay. thank you and hasta la próxima. Hasta la, hasta la próxima, hasta presto. Mm, pronto. Uh, I think I might check in.